So in the last set of slides, we were talking mostly about dead space management, wound management, um, and um, I think with open fractures and uh, mangled extremities and salvage, uh, the next big thing to discuss is going to be uh, dealing with bone loss. So when you have a bone defect, there is a few options. Um, one actually, it's not mentioned here, would be uh, shortening and uh, that can be done to a certain degree except that there are limitations with regard to of course affecting the function of the patient by shortening an extremity. Uh, certainly in the lower extremities it's a little bit of a bigger problem than in the humerus for example. But uh, the other issues are uh, extreme shortening acutely also can be potentially a, a vascular problem. You could lead to kinking of the vessels and flow issues, uh, but uh, to some degree, some degree of shortening is potentially possible acutely. And then of course you could always lengthen something later. Uh, but let's just say if you're dealing with a uh, you know area of bone that you need to reconstitute, uh, maybe you've already shortened it, but now you want to get back out to length. or you're keeping it at length and you need to deal with the defect. Well, there's autogenous cancellus and cortical grafts, or basically bone grafts from the patient themselves. Uh, there's Ilazarov method. Uh, there's intercalary non-vascularized uh, graft. Um, and then there's vascularized uh, uh, autograft. I mean, these are just some of the uh, major options that you have uh, to choose from. There are some uh, no, yeah, it's sort of newer methods uh, that uh, I've just thrown up a couple of examples here uh, that you may see, may hear about, may see some reports about. Uh, one of them is using uh, mesh cages uh, with graft as an alternative uh, um, uh, way of stability, uh, providing stability, and then others are using uh, things like BMP2 uh, and allograft instead of autograft harvest or other methods using uh, bone marrow aspirate and allograft harvest or using other um, either bone morphogenetic proteins like BMP7 or um, other materials altogether, platelet derived growth factor and everything. I'm not going to go into all of these, right? I mean the topic is really focused on uh, limb salvage but um, should be aware of them. And on the horizon, certainly when you read the basic science literature, um, things like BMP7 and allograft, gene therapy, one stage transport, these are all possible uh, models that uh, uh, may help uh, deal with bone loss. Ilazarov method is certainly a tried and true method. Um, it is very uh, intensive treatment, uh, certainly requires some patience on the part of the surgeon and the patient. Uh, you need somebody who's uh, uh, a surgeon obviously who's, who's skilled and comfortable managing these and then uh, a patient who is uh, interested, willing, and able to uh, perform uh, the, the transport because they frequently have to turn these little dials. Uh, there are newer devices that are a little bit more automated, but uh, traditional Ilazarov uh, technique looks something like this, right? So you have your, your area of bone loss in here, okay, and oftentimes when you uh, have the bone loss, you have to, you have to put, put a little spacer in here, remember? Uh, body doesn't like having uh, empty dead spaces, so you put a little bit of a spacer in here. Uh, you come up here, do a uh, corticotomy, okay, or a low energy osteotomy. Uh, you wait a uh, latency period uh, for the adult tibia, it's roughly a week, 10 days, and then you start a gradual distraction. So this ring here, which is fixed into the middle segment, uh, drags that segment down, okay, and in the adult tibia, typically it's a millimeter a day um, at a rhythm of uh, four uh, adjustments per day. So usually a quarter millimeter spaced out four times a day, uh, millimeter a day in the adult tibia. And then when you get down here, you dock. Of course, that spacer, you may have to actually make it a little bit of a smaller size, something to be in that space, uh, maybe deliver antibiotics, and then you do have to come and take that out while this patient is transporting down. Uh, and then oftentimes when it docks, you sometimes have to come in here doing bone graft. And of course, there are methods of uh, lengthening over a nail because once you do this transport, that bone does not, you know, see, you can see here, you've gone 
from this situation to this situation, you've only seen wisps of bone. Okay, but then over time, that bone consolidates, but you have to keep the fixator on for months and months and months. So the transport time usually is, you know, a bit of time, but then the consolidation time takes much longer. Uh, that's where potentially, instead of having a uh, frame on, having a, an intramedial layer nail in place uh, can really work for you. And then once you're out to length, you lock it, maybe you have to bone graft at the docking site. Anyhow, just a few bits about uh, Ilozarov uh, method. Very powerful tool. Uh, it's amazing, really, when you think about it, that you can uh, just grow bone, essentially, uh, where there, where, where there's, you, know, you make a gap and you turn it into bone. It's, I think it's kind of amazing. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Paley uh, reported uh, in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma 2000 uh, on a case series with big defect, right? Average 10 centimeter bone defects. Here's a this is examples from that paper. It was R of distraction done uh, 16 months in an X-Fix. Remember, a lot of that is for the consolidation time. You're, just, you're keeping it on there so they can walk in the frame. You, know, you worry that they're going to fracture if you take it off. Um, approximately three procedures per patient. And I think that's pretend, I, think, I would say probably a little bit low. Many patients undergo uh, a lot more. Vascularized fibular graft, um, often done for bigger defects, um, and if, this is very, uh, as opposed to, you know, Ilozarov, which does require some surgeon expertise, it's really a relatively low-tech technique, um, certainly born out of necessity, almost like a, a reverse innovation from uh, Siberia, um, and Dr. Ilozarov, uh, to vascularize fibular graft, which is a very high-tech, um, and what I mean by that is, um, it's it, it's very uh, uh, dependent on the skill sets of the surgeon, the center. Uh, simply put, not every place can do this because they don't have the resources, uh, both human resources and hospital resources otherwise, to, to pull this off and be successful. Um, but if done, you basically can immediately take a defect, uh, here shown in the femur, transport uh, fibular uh, graft into there, and uh, with some uh, donor site morbidity, of course, uh, taking a fibula out of somebody's leg, uh, but you can, you don't have to grow all this bone, it's put right there, you get it to heal, and uh, in expert hands, this can work for really big defects, okay? Here's just the example of caging, uh, or cage with uh, bone grafting, so you can see, uh, example here, you fill this with bone graft, and uh, uh, they've augmented, in this case, with internal fixation, but it's, a, it's an interesting technique. Uh, that's been out there now for a little while. Uh, it's certainly not used a whole lot. I think if this were ever to get infected or have a problem, I don't know how you would, you know, dig this thing out of here. But uh, just a, an interesting technique out there. Okay, another example in the proximal tibia. So you can see why uh, there may be some uh, interest in, in doing something like this because it provides mechanical support and maintains your graft and, uh, you know, potentially can allow a patient to we bear a little bit earlier, and here you can see some examples of, the, of, of that healing. What about bone morphogenetic proteins? Well, um, BMP2 certainly is FDA approved for open tibia fractures treated with IM nail. So if you have a type 3B open tibia fracture, let's say, you've, and you've nailed it and you're now about to do your soft tissue uh, coverage procedure, uh, that is the time when it is potentially an option because it's FDA approved for that exact moment. Uh, to do BMP2 at the time of wound coverage and closure, and um, at least in the early studies that got FDA approval, it was shown to be um, it was shown to be helpful uh, in those cases. Um, it can be used for fracture non-unions. It can be used to treat uh, tibial cortical defects. These are other papers uh, that have demonstrated its use. It certainly has not, I would say, come into very widespread use. Um, some of the early excitement about it has been tempered somewhat by more recent papers, um, but it, it is still an option, an expensive one at that. Uh, a couple of papers uh, looking at using this for uh, residual cortical defects. So let's say you, just, uh, you, know, you have a tibia, you have a tibia fracture, and uh, you still have this residual cortical defect. You fixed it with a rod and screws, but you have this thing. So, I mean, uh, one option is that uh, you, you come in and deal with this defect with uh, autograft, 
Um, perhaps you do a uh, mask LA technique and you put a spacer in here, okay, probably worth writing that down here. Mask LA technique is when you put a spacer, like we talked about before, instead of beads you put a spacer in, you come back after four or six weeks until the wound has declared itself that it's not infected, you take that out and then you do autogenous grafting. Well, an option is to also put in BMP2 and um, allograft, okay, in this, this case was this is where it's shown here is the example of tibia, kind of just like I drew uh, residual defect treated this way. So here's just a little summary slide. I think this kind of breaks it down. Uh, I don't think this is a hard set rule, but um, uh, this is just a little bit of a guide. I think makes some sense. So for short, small defects, for small defects, shortening is potentially a good option, right? So if somebody has less than a centimeter defect, they're probably better off they need a little shoe left. A centimeter is not a big enough deal to warrant otherwise having to go back and do repeated surgeries to get a gap to heal. Uh, just compress that, close that down, shorten them. You're probably going to be better off. Uh, let the patient know that there's a rationale for doing that. Of course, because some people uh, like to sue their doctors if their leg comes out a little bit short and they don't know why. Cancellus grafting. Um, is an option certainly when you start to get to a little bit bigger defect and I would say that this number you know 0.5 to 3 I mean I would even say this can go to you know four centimeters maybe even bigger it's really limited to some degree by the amount of graft that you can harvest right and I would say you know this is autogenous graft right so if you're really dealing with massive bone defects I think you're gold standard because it has potentially some cells that get transported with it. It has BMPs. It has some structural support. So I still think autograft has a, a lot of virtues, both you know iliac crest and um, uh, like harvested bone from the uh, femoral canal uh, or wherever you get it from. Um, it's, it's so this this size here is limited to some degree by the amount of graft that you're able to harvest. So traditionally, it's always been a little small. With newer methods now, we can potentially get more graft, and you see surgeons going for bigger defects, three, four, five centimeter defects, by just putting in a ton of bone graft in there. So I, I would say that this potentially can be pushed a little bit. Uh, I think when you start to get the big defects, four, five, six centimeter defects, uh, then start people start thinking about uh, transport as an option, if you like doing that, uh, that is uh, Ilazarov. And then for uh, really big defects, sometimes you have to think more about a vascularized graft, double transport perhaps, um, if you don't have vascularized grafting at your institution. And then for ridiculously big defects, you know, sometimes it's just too much to do and that limb should not be salvaged. All right, so I think I'll um, pause there. We talked a lot about bone defects and uh, we'll pick up uh, with the rest of this material in the next set of slides. Thank you.